What are some well-known axiomatic systems? One of the most well-known axiomatic systems was developed by the Greek mathematician Euclid, c. 325 c. 270 BCE. He presented 13 books of geometry and other mathematics titled Elements. Or Stoichion in Greek. Included in these books were theorems about geometry and numbers derived from five postulates about points, lines, circles, and angles. Four axioms about equality, and one axiom stating the whole is greater than the part. A more modern axiomatic system is the axiomatic set theory. Which is based on eight axioms and three undefined terms. How are numbers classified? The set of natural numbers are also called integers or counting or whole numbers, which are usually defined as the positive and negative whole numbers, along with zero, zero. What is a normalized vector? A normalized, or unit, Vector is one in which the sum of the squares of all coordinates is equal to 1. For example, the vector, 2, 2, 0, is not normalized. The vectors, 0 0.707, 0 0.707, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1.0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, are normalized. An outward normal is another name for a normalized vector. It represents the direction that a polygon surface or vertex endpoint is facing. Normalized, or unit, vectors are often seen written as X, that is often referred to as a hat. How is linear algebra used to determine the stability of structures? Structural engineers use linear algebra a great deal. Mainly because there are numerous equations with many unknowns associated with the analysis of a structure in equilibrium. Most of the time, these equations are linear, even when bending, material deformation, is involved. Linear algebra can also be used for other structural concerns, because it deals with the study of vectors. Vector spaces, linear transformations, and systems of linear equations. Of course, Linear algebra is not only used to understand structures. Almost every subfield in engineering uses these types of mathematical calculations. For more about linear algebra and linear equations, see Algebra. What does it mean when a test score is marked on the curve? A test score marked on the curve means that the marks will roughly follow what is often called a Gaussian probability distribution or, more commonly, a bell curve. 
This symmetrically shaped curve is based on the test scores of the exam. In a perfect world, one-sixth of the scores would be on either end of the curve. With more than two-thirds falling in the middle, creating a normal distribution. But most test results are not ideal. Thus, when a plot of the number of students versus the marks received are viewed. The relative difficulty of the test is known. It is then up to the teacher to decide how to distribute the grades. This is usually done by comparing each student's mark to the distribution curve. The teacher then decides where to cut off the passing and failing marks. Which is often referred to as curving the grades. For more about normal distribution, see Applied Mathematics. What are some common modern measurement systems? There are several measurement systems in use today. The English customary system is also known as the standard system. U.S. customary system, or units, or English units. It actually consists of two related systems, the U.S. customary units and the British imperial system. The background of the units of measurement is historically rich and includes modern familiar terms. Such as foot, inch, mile, and pound, as well as less well-known units, such as span, cubit, and rod. The official policy of the United States government is to designate the metric system as the preferred system for trade and commerce. But customary units are still widely used on consumer products and in industrial manufacturing. In order to link all systems of weights and measures, both metric and non-metric, there is a network of international agreements supporting what is known as the International System of Units. It is abbreviated as SI, but not SI. In reference to the first two initials of its French name, System International des Unites. It was developed from an agreement signed in Paris on May 20. 1875, known as the Treaty of the Meter, Convention du Meter. To date, 48 nations have signed the treaty. The SI is maintained by a small agency in Paris, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. BIPM, or Bureau International de Poids et Messieurs. Because there is a need to change or update the precision of measurements over time. The SI is updated every few years by the International General Conference on Weights and Measures. Or CGPM, or Conference Générale de Poids et Messieurs, the two most recent meetings being. In 2003 and 2007. SI is also referred to as the metric system, which is based on the meter. The word can also be used in mathematics, for example, metric space, or even computing, font metric file. It is often referred to incorrectly as metrical. See below for more about the metric system. What is numerical weather prediction?
numerical weather prediction is forecasting the weather using numerical models. Because of the complexity of the mathematics involved not to mention the number of variables needed to predict the weather all numerical model studies are run on high-speed computers. The computer solves a set of equations resulting in a computer model of the atmosphere showing how weather conditions will change over time. What are some more recent philosophies of mathematical logic? Mathematical knowledge and logic in the late 20th and early 21st centuries has been greatly impacted by the development of predicate calculus and the digital computer. Out of these ideas not to mention centuries of mathematics and logic. Groundwork come three of the latest philosophical doctrines of mathematical thought. Formalism is the idea that mathematics is truly formal, therefore. It is only concerned with the algorithmic manipulation of symbols. In formalism, Predicate calculus does not denote predicates or anything else meaning mathematical objects do not exist at all. This definitely fits into today's world of computers, especially in the field of artificial intelligence. But this philosophy does not take into account human mathematical understanding. Not to mention mathematical applications in physics and engineering. Constructivism was a fringe movement at the turn of the 21st century. Constructionists believe that mathematical knowledge is obtained by a series of purely mental constructions. With all mathematical objects existing only in the mind of the mathematician. But constructivism does not take into account the external world. And when it is taken to extremes it can mean that there is no possibility of communication from one mind to another. This philosophy also runs the risk of rejecting the basic laws of logic. For example, if you have a mathematical problem with a yes or no nature, and the answer is unknown, then neither yes nor no is in the mind of the mathematician. This means that a disjunction is not a legitimate mathematical assumption, and, thus, ideas such as Aristotle's law of the excluded middle, either or, are cast aside. Not many modern mathematicians want to throw out centuries of logic. Set theoretical Platonism sounds as if mathematicians are regressing back to Plato's time. In reality, this philosophy is based on a variant of the Platonic doctrine of recollection in which we are born possessing all knowledge. And our realization of that knowledge is contingent on our discovery of it. In the set theoretical Platonism, infinite sets exist in a non-material, purely mathematical realm. By extending our intuitive understanding of this realm, we can cope with problems such as those encountered by the Gödel incompleteness theorem. But this philosophy, like the others, has a seemingly infinite number of gaps. Especially the question of how a theory of infinite sets can be applied to a finite world. What Greek mathematician made major contributions to geometry?
the Greek mathematician Euclid, c. 325 c. 270 BCE, contributed to the development of arithmetic and the geometric theory of quadratic equations. Although little is known about his life except that he taught in Alexandria. Egypt his contributions to geometry are well understood. The elementary geometry many of us learn in high school is still largely based on Euclid. His 13 books of geometry and other mathematics. Titled Elements, or Stoichion in Greek, were classics of his day. The first six volumes offer explanations of elementary plane geometry, the other books present the theory of numbers. Certain problems in arithmetic, on a geometric basis, and solid geometry. He also defines basic terms such as point and line, certain related axioms and postulates. And a number of statements logically deduced from definitions, axioms, and postulates. For more information on axioms and postulates, see Foundations of Mathematics. For more information about Euclid, see Geometry and Trigonometry. What is a puzzle? A puzzle is a mathematical problem that produces a solution often in the form of rearranging pieces. Often geometric, or filling in the blanks, such as a crossword puzzle. Puzzles do not typically require superior mathematical knowledge, but many originate from more advanced mathematical or logistical problems. They also include board games, such as chess, and brain teasers. What is a sample space? In any experiment, there are certain possible outcomes. The set of all possible outcomes is called the sample space of the experiment. Each possible result is represented by one and only one point in the sample space. Which is usually denoted by the letter S. To each element of the sample space, or to each possible outcome, a probability measure between 0 and 1 is assigned. With the sum of all the probability measures in the sample space equal to 1. What are some other examples of dissection puzzles? There are several other example of dissection puzzles, including the following. The Haberdasher Problem Pythagorean Square Puzzle T Puzzle Puzzle Inventor Henry Ernest Dudeney, 1857-1930 Of England was instrumental in developing many more puzzles than the cryptarithmetic puzzle described above. One of the most famous of his geometrical puzzles is the Haberdasher's problem. Which asks how an equilateral triangle can be cut into four pieces and reassembled to form a square. His model used hinges that would move the pieces into place. In the Pythagorean square puzzle the two squares on the left are combined to form a single large square on the right. 
The T puzzle is a dissection puzzle that forms the letter T. Four pieces are used to create the capital letter, as seen on P425. What is the derivative of a function? One of the most important, core concepts in modern mathematics and calculus is the derivative of a function or a function derived from another function. A derivative is also expressed as the limit of dy slash dx. Also set as the derivative of y with respect to x. It is actually the rate of change, or slope on a graph, of the original function. The derivative represents an infinitesimal change in the function with respect to the parameters contained within the function. In particular, the process of finding the derivative of the function y equals f, x, is called differentiation. The derivative is most frequently written as dy slash dx, it is also expressed in various other ways. Including f, x, set as the derivative of a function f with respect to x, y, df, x, df, x, or dxy. It is important to note that the differentials, written as dy and dx, represent singular symbols and not the products of the two symbols. Not all derivatives exist for all values of a function, the sharp corner of a graph, in which there is no definite slope and thus no derivative is an example. What are logical operators in truth tables? Logical operators in truth tables include such words as and or or, which are all represented by certain symbols. For more about logical operators in predicate calculus, see below. For example, and, also called the conjunction operator, is also referred to as a binary operator. It is one of the most useful logical operators, as in P and Q, represented by the symbol slash backslash or and. The or, also called the disjunction operator, is also a binary operator. As in P or Q, and represented by the symbols V and. The not, also called the negation or inversion, operator is known as a unary operator and is represented by the symbols OR, in computer programming, NOT is often represented by the But note, not all logical operators seem to represent words the way we are accustomed to using them. And many times they seem to contradict their proper definitions. But in a truth table, the logical operator means what it means without the usual nuances of our English language. What is a carrot? A carrot is a unit of measurement representing the weight of precious stones pearls, and certain metals, such as gold. It was originally a unit of mass based on the carob seed or bean used by ancient merchants. In the Middle East, in terms of weight measurement, a carat equals 3 and 1 fifth grains troy. 
and it is also divided into four grains, sometimes referred to as carrot grains. Diamonds and other precious stones are estimated by carats and fractions of carats. Pearls are usually measured by carat grains, for more about grains and measurement, see mathematics throughout history. Carats of gold are measured based on the number of twenty-fourths of pure gold. For example, twenty-four carat gold is pure gold, but for a goldsmith standard, it is actually 22 parts gold, 1 part copper, and 1 part silver, as real gold is too malleable to hold its shape, 18 karat gold is 75% pure, 14 karat gold is 58.33% pure, and 10 karat gold is 41.67% pure gold. What is an electronic calculator? Most people nowadays are familiar with electronic calculators, small. Battery-powered digital electronic devices that perform simple arithmetic operations and are limited to handling numerical data. Data are entered using a small keypad on the face of the calculator, the output or result, is most commonly a single number on an LCD, liquid crystal display, or other display. It took a long time to go from the electronic motor driven mechanical calculator to the electronic calculator. In 1961, the company Sumlock Comptometer of England introduced the Anita. A new inspiration to arithmetic, the first electronic calculator. Who first made some of the first accurate measurements of the Earth? Hellenic geographer, librarian, and astronomer Eratosthenes of Cyrene. 276 to 194 BCE, made several accurate measurements of the Earth. Which is why he is often known as the father of geodesy, the science of Earth measurement. Although he was not the very first to deduce the Earth's circumference. Eratosthenes is thought by most historians to be the first to accurately measure it. Eratosthenes knew the sun's light at noon reached the bottom of a well in Syene. Now Aswan on the Nile River in Egypt, meaning the sun was directly overhead, on the summer solstice. He compared it to a well's shadow at the same time in Alexandria. Knowing that the zenith distance, the angle from the zenith point directly overhead to the point where the sun was at noon, was zero degrees at Syene, this meant that at Alexandria it was about seven degrees. By measuring these angles and the distance between the two cities, Eratos thence used geometry to deduce that the Earth's circumference was 250,000 stadia. The number was later revised to 252,000 stadia, or 25,054 miles, 40,320 kilometers. The actual circumference of the planet is 24,857 miles, 40,009 kilometers, around the poles and 24,900 miles. 40,079 kilometers, around the equator, because the Earth is not completely round. 
from his data Eratos thence also determined another accurate measurement, the Earth's diameter. He deduced the Earth was 7,850 miles, 12,631 kilometers, in diameter. Which is close to the modern mean value of 7,918 miles, 12,740 kilometers. What happens when you multiply a matrix by the identity matrix? When you multiply any n by n matrix by the identity matrix, you get that same matrix back again. Therefore, let the letter i represent the n by n identity matrix, and a represent any other n by n matrix. We then have AXI equals A and IXA equals A. This is much like the situation when using the real numbers, XX1 equals X and 1XX equals X. Did the Egyptians eventually develop different numerals? Yes, the Egyptians used another number system called Hieratic numerals after the invention of writing on papyrus. This allowed larger numbers to be written in a more compact form. For example, there were separate symbols for 1 through 9, 10, 20, 30, and so on. 100, 200, 300, and so on, and 1000, 2000, 3000, and so on. The only drawback was that the system required memorization. Of more symbols many more than for hieroglyphic notation. It took four distinct hieratic symbols to represent the number 3577, it took no less than 22 symbols to represent the same number in hieroglyphs, but most of those symbols were redundant. See illustration on P15. Both hieroglyphic and hieratic numerals existed together for close to 2000 years from the 3rd to the 1st millennium BCE. In general, Hieroglyph numerals were used when carved on such objects as stone obelisks, palace and temple walls, and tombs. The hieratic symbols were much faster and easier to scribe, and they were written on papyrus for records. Inventories, wills, or for mathematical, astronomical, economic, legal or even magical works. Even though it is thought that the hieratic symbols were developed from the corresponding hieroglyphs. The shapes of the signs changed considerably. One reason in particular came from the reed brushes used to write hieratic symbols. Writing on papyrus differed greatly from writing using stone carvings. Thus the need to change the symbols to fit the writing devices. And as kingdoms and dynasties changed, the hieratic numerals changed. 2. With users having to memorize the many distinct signs. How are equations with exponents and logarithms solved? The way to solve an exponential equation is relatively easy. 
take the log of both sides of the equation, then solve for the variable. For example, to solve for x in the equation x equals 60, first, take the natural log, ln, of both sides. ln, x, equals ln, 60, simplify using the logarithmic rule number 3, see above, for the left side, x ln, e, equals ln, 60, then simplify again, since ln, e, equals 1 to, x equals ln, 60, equals 4.09434562 and finally, check your answer. Using log tables or your calculator, in the original equation x equals 60, e 4.09434562 equals 60 is definitely true. The way to solve a logarithmic equation is equally easy. Just rewrite the equation in exponential form and solve for the variable. For example, to solve for x in the equation ln, x, equals 11, first, change both sides so they are exponents of the base e. ln, x, equals e11 when the bases of the exponent and logarithm are the same. The left part of the equation becomes x, thus, it can be written, x equals e11 to obtain x. Determine the solution for e11, or x is approximately 59,874.14172. And finally, check your answer. Using tables or your calculator, in the original equation ln, x, equals 11, ln, 59,874.14172, equals 11 is definitely true. What is an Argand diagram? An Argand diagram is a graphical way of representing a function of a complex variable, often written as z equals x plus e, in which x, y, and z are coordinates in three-dimensional space and i is an imaginary number. Its true discoverer is not actually known, but Swiss mathematician Jean Robert Argand. 1768-1822, is given credit for the diagram. It is thought that this was also independently discovered by Danish mathematician Caspar Wessel. 1745-1818, and later by German mathematician and physicist Carl Friedrich Gauss. 1777-1855, in 1832, but he probably determined it much earlier, thus, its other name is the Gaussian plane. How does one calculate resting heart rate? Calculating resting heart rate, RHR, involves easy math. It is the number of heartbeats per minute when the body is resting. With the beats per minute representing the number of times the heart contracts. To measure the RHR, just count the number of beats per minute via the pulse usually. Taken either on the inside of the wrist or along either side of the neck for 15 seconds. Then multiply this number by 4, 15x4 equals 60 seconds, to get the heart rate per minute. Or count for 10 seconds, then multiply this number times 6. 6x10 equals 60 seconds, to get the heart rate per minute. 
For example, if you count 12 beats in 10 seconds, multiply 12 by 6 to get a resting heart rate of 72. What do computers and arithmetic have in common? Computers and arithmetic have a great deal in common. Arithmetical operations are actually digital computer operations in which the numerical quantities are computed. Either through adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, or otherwise comparing them. Arithmetical instructions give a computer program direction to perform an arithmetic operation on specific types of data. Such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. The sections of the computer that carry out these computations and other. Logic operations are called arithmetical units, or arithmetic sections. For more information about computers and math, see Math in Computing. What is a microprocessor? A microprocessor is a silicon chip that contains a CPU, or central processing unit, which is normally located on the main circuit board in a computer. In the world of personal computers, the terms microprocessor and CPU are often used interchangeably. These chips, or integrated circuits, are small. Thin pieces of silicon onto which the transistors making up the microprocessor have been etched. The microprocessor is the heart of any normal computer, from desktops and laptop machines to a larger server. They have many uses. For example, they control the logic of almost all familiar digital devices from microwaves and clock radios to fuel injection systems for automobiles. What are the cube and the cube root? Much like a square, a cube is when you multiply a real or complex number by twice itself. Making a total of three numbers. Mathematicians express the cube of a number using the superscript 3, or, for example, 23, or 2x2x2. Unlike a square of a number, the cube of a number will not always be positive such as minus 3x minus 3x minus 3, which equals minus 9. A cube root is a number that when multiplied by itself two more times has the product of s, in which t3 equals s. For example, the cube root of 125, s, is 5, t, or written as v3 1 2 5 equals 5, the cube root of minus 125 is minus 5. What is the difference between the Earth's sidereal and solar days? The difference between the Earth's side real and solar days has to do with angles and the Earth's rotation. The mean solar day is equal to 24 hours, or the average of all the solar days in an orbital year. 
the mean side real day is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 04.09053 seconds. It is not exactly equal to a solar day because by the time the Earth has rotated once, it has moved a little in its orbit around the Sun. Thus, it rotates for about another 4 minutes before the Sun is considered to be back in exactly the same place in the sky as it was the day before. The actual divisions of geologic time are not arbitrary, or uniform. The larger divisions are based on major events that occurred sporadically over the Earth's long history. For example, the end of the Permian period, about 240 million years ago, was marked by a major catastrophe. Some scientists estimate that close to 90% of all species on the Earth died at that time. Resulting in a major extinction event that may have been caused by huge volcanic eruptions or even a space object striking the Earth. The smaller divisions are usually based on specific local structures or fossils found within the rock. Most often they are named after local towns, people, and sundry other nearby associations. What is a base in mathematics? The term base has many meanings in the English language, including several that apply to the field of mathematics. When talking about sets, bases are the open sets whose union forms an abstract entity called a topological space. In geometry, the base represents the side of a polygon or polyhedron that is perceived as its bottom. When referring to an isosceles triangle, the base is the side that differs in length from the other two. Thus, the base angles include the side that is thought of as the base. Algebraists also use the term base to describe either the number used with an exponent to create a power such as 34 equals 81, or to write the same number as a subscript to a logarithm, such as log 381 equals 4. For more information about logarithms, see algebra. One of the more familiar uses of the term base in mathematics deals with our numbering system, in which a base is a natural number whose powers are added to produce a specific number. For example, using 10 as a base, the number 2583.789 is actually 2x103 plus 5x102 plus 8x101 plus 3x100 plus 7x10 to 1, plus, 8x10 to 2, plus, 9x10 to 3. What is mathematical biology? Mathematical biology is another word for biomathematics. The interdisciplinary field that includes the modeling of natural biological processes using mathematical techniques. Mathematical biology is carried out by mathematicians, physicists, and biologists from various disciplines within their fields. These scientists work on such problems as modeling blood vessel formation with possible applications to drug therapies, 
modeling the electrophysiology of the heart. Exploring enzyme reaction within the body, and even developing models that track the spread of disease. What is the golden ratio? The golden ratio, also known as extreme and mean ratio, golden section, golden mean, or divine proportion, is a number that has many interesting properties. It is associated with the balance between symmetry and asymmetry used in art and design. Two quantities are said to be in the golden ratio if the whole is to the larger as the larger is to the smaller. Euclid expressed it as, a straight line is said to have been cut in extreme and mean ratio when as the whole line is to the greater segment, so is the greater to the less. This is seen in the accompanying illustration, in which for two segments A and B, the entire line is to the A segment as A is to the B segment. Who first developed set theory? German mathematician George, George, Ferdinand Ludwig Philipp Cantor. 1845-1918, was not only known for his work on transfinite numbers, but also for his development of set theory. Which is the basis of modern mathematical analysis, for more information on set theory, see Foundations of Mathematics. His Mathematisk Analen was a basic introduction to set theory. Unlike most long evolutionary histories of mathematical subjects, Cantor's set theory was his creation alone. In the late 19th century, Cantor also developed the continuum hypothesis. He realized that there were many different sized infinities. Further conjecturing that two particular infinities constructed by different processes were the same size. What is meteorology? Meteorology is the study of atmospheric phenomena, their interactions, and processes. It is often considered part of the earth sciences and is most commonly associated with weather and weather forecasting. What are the humanities? Humanities are those studies dealing with the fine arts, painting, drawing, and so on, literature, philosophy, and cultural science. This field focuses on the idea of expanding human thought, intellectual skills, and accomplishment through the study of these branches. Although the humanities seem far removed from mathematics, there are actually many connections. Is there such a thing as a perfect number? Yes, there is such a thing as a perfect number 
but it is not what we think of as true perfection. To mathematicians, perfect numbers are somewhat rare. They are defined as a natural number, or positive integer, in which the sum of its positive divisors or the bottom number in a fraction that divides the number to equal another whole number and includes one but not the number itself, is the number itself. For example, 6 is considered a perfect number because its divisors are 1, 2, and 3 or 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6. The next perfect numbers are 28, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. 496, 8,128, 33,550,336, 8,550,336, 137,489,866, 137,489,866, 137,489,866, 137,489,866, 2,305,843,008,139,952,128, and so on. Larger and larger perfect numbers are still being discovered. Especially with the help of today's faster and more memory-packed computers. What is radioactive decay? Mathematics can also be applied to radioactive substances found within certain rocks. Radioactive decay is the disintegration of a radioactive substance and the emission of certain ionizing radiation such as alpha or beta particles or even gamma rays. Simply put, when rocks form, the minerals within the rock often contain certain radioactive atoms that decay at a specific rate. Radioactive decay is especially important in radioactive dating in which the original and decayed radioactive elements are used to determine the age of the rock. This is because certain radioactive elements will decay to a mixture of half the original element and half another element, or isotope, in a specific time frame. This is also called the half-life of the original element. For example, Half of the uranium-238 in a rock will decay into lead-207 in 704 million years. Thus, the half-life of uranium-238 is said to be 704 million years. Statistically, this change follows a specific decay function for each isotope of an element. And in each of these exponential functions, the time for the function's value to decrease to half is constant. Making radioactive dating perfect in determining the age of certain rocks. What is prime factorization? Many of us are most familiar with prime factorization. Which is a way of taking a number and breaking it down into its constituent primes. An example of prime factorization is as follows, one finds the simplest representation of the given quantity in terms of smaller parts in the case of 15, the factors would be 1, 3, 5, and 15, Essentially, all the numbers that will divide integrally into 15. Not that prime factorization is always that easy. 
larger numbers make it more difficult to factor. And many sophisticated prime algorithms have been devised for larger and different types of numbers. What are some of the statistical data gathered during the periodic United States Census? Every 10 years, the U.S. government takes a census that gathers important statistical data about the entire population. In the 2000 census, this included place of residence, age, gender, race, ancestry, marital status, education, date of birth, place of birth, disabilities, Work information Military service, language spoken at home, housing information, and school enrollment Not all questions are repeated each census year. For example, 100% of the population was asked about their marital status in 1990, in 2000. It was only asked on a sample basis. According to the analysis of the 2000 U.S. information. On April 1, 2000, the population of the United States stood at 281,421,906. What famous structures were built using mathematics? Actually, all famous structures needed mathematics. Especially in the initial phases of design and construction. Some of the more famous and exceptionally challenging buildings include the Chrysler Building in New York. A steel frame skyscraper built around 1930 that was the tallest building in the world before the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building in New York, a steel-framed, stone-clad commercial office skyscraper. Built in 1931 that rises 1,252 feet 381 meters high, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. Designed by architect Gustave Eiffel and built between 1887 and 1889 as a 985-foot 300-meter-tall exposition iron observation tower. And the Sears Tower in Chicago, built between 1974 to 1976, it is a steel frame with glass stroke. Tour standing at 1,450 feet 442 meters tall and is, to date, the tallest building in the United States. Places such as the Monterey Aquarium, built around 1980 with reinforced concrete and made compatible. With surrounding waterfront structures, also needed mathematics in order to be constructed. Of course, when one gets down to it. All types of construction require some math knowledge for them to be built, even a modest piece of cabinetry. How is the amount of rainfall measured? The amount of rainfall liquid precipitation that falls to the surface is measured by a rain gauge. The most commonly used freestanding rain gauge is a cylinder with increments. Most often in inches, inscribed on the outside of the tube. 
it is put in an area that is not obstructed by buildings, trees, or other tall structures that can impede the collection of rainfall. The rain gauge can also measure snow, but added steps are needed to calculate this. In this case, a rain gauge measures the liquid equivalent of snow. This is why meteorologists will often say that a snowstorm that produces 10 inches 25.4 centimeters of snow will have a liquid equivalent of 1 inch. 2.54 centimeters of rain, or a ratio of 10 colon 1. But this generalization can be tricky. If the weather system is super cold, such as an Arctic air mass over Canada and the northern United States. The below freezing temperatures might create more than 10 inches of snow per inch of rain. Meteorologists often call this the fluff factor, because the snow seems fluffier due to the fact that there is more air between the snow crystals at much colder temperatures. In fact, in very cold air the snow to liquid equivalent ratio can be 15, 20, or even 30 to 1. For more about weather and math, see Math in the Natural Sciences. What are some examples of clock arithmetic? As stated above, the clock would be considered arithmetic modulo. With calculations including such statements as shown below. Note, in all of the first calculations. The equal sign can be replaced with the congruence sign three lines instead of the two for an equal sign. How do you perform imaginary number computations? Imaginary numbers come in handy to do many computations, especially something called simplification. What is a store discount? Many stores from apparel shops to bookstores offer a discount on the retail price or less often, on the sale price. For example, say a sweater that originally costs $50 is discounted by 25% during a sale at a department store. The customer will actually pay 75% or 75 slash 100 or 0.75 of $50 to determine the sale price. Multiply $50 by 25%, 50x 0.25 equals 12.50. Then subtract the discount from the original price to find the sale price or $50 $12.50 equals $37.50. What are the different categories of modern calculus? Modern calculus is divided into numerous types. The following lists just a few of these categories, basic calculus basic calculus is the branch of mathematics concerned with limits and with the differentiation and integration of functions. 
there is also advanced calculus. Which takes an even more complex view of calculus, with an emphasis on proofs. Differential calculus Differential calculus deals with the variation of a function with respect to changes in the independent variable, s. It does this by determining derivatives and differentials. Integral calculus Integral calculus, logically, deals with integration and its application to solve differential equations, it is also used to determine areas and volumes. Other various analyses Other parts of calculus entail various types of analyses. Such as vector, tensor, and complex analyses, and differential geometry. Also remember that the term calculus is a generic name for any area of mathematics dealing with calculation. Thus, arithmetic could be called the calculus of numbers. It is also why there are such terms as imaginary calculus or a method of looking at the relationships between real or imaginary quantities using imaginary symbols and quantities. In algebra that do not mean the type of calculus discussed elsewhere in this chapter. What is balancing a checkbook? Balancing a checkbook is often a challenge. For some people, forgetting to enter checks written against or deposits made into the account creates the biggest balancing problems. For others, it is not depositing enough money to cover written checks. There really is no art to keeping a checkbook. It is just a matter of checks and balances or debits and credits and a little bit of simple mathematics. To keep a healthy checkbook, there are several things a person can do. For example, Keep a running balance of distributed checks in a check ledger. Whenever you write a check, write the amount in the ledger booklet most banks give with the checks. In the proper column, list the check number, who the check is made out to, and any other important information. The amount in the negative, dash, or debit, column, and subtract the check amount from the last balance. Along with making out checks, taking out money, keep a record of deposits made in the checkbook register. Deposits are usually written in the positive column, plus, or credit. Don't let the money get low if the account balance goes into negative numbers. The account does not have enough money to cover the checks. If more money is not put into the checking account at this point, the checks will bounce. Or not clear with sufficient funds. This is not good. Most banks charge substantial fees to the account owner for bounced checks, not the person to whom the check is made out. Whenever you receive your bank statement, check to see if the balance agrees with your checkbook. This is called balancing the checkbook. As you compare the checks that have cleared with the listing in the register, check each off with an X or check mark. Also subtract any bank charges, such as ATM, automated teller machine, fees. If all of the checks have cleared, and all charges have been accounted for, the balance of the checkbook and statement should agree, unless the bank gives interest on checking accounts. 
If so, add the interest to the checkbook under the plus or credit column. If not all the items have cleared, check the bank statement and note the ones not marked. Total all these outstanding transactions. Subtract the total of the outstanding transactions from the end balance on the bank statement. Then add any deposits that are not on the bank statement to this new balance. The numbers should match the balance in the check register. If they don't, go back over the addition and subtraction in the checkbook register to catch any inaccuracies. Which is often the reason why a checkbook doesn't balance. How does one interpret sets? There are several ways to look at sets. Two sets, or more, are considered identical if, and only if, they have the same collection of objects or entities. This is a principle known as extensionality. For example, the set A, B, C is considered to be the same as set A, B, C. Of course, because the elements are the same, the set A, B, C and the set C, B, A are also the same, even though they are written in a different order. It becomes more complex when sets are elements of other sets. So it is important to note the position of the brackets. For example, the set A, B, C is distinct from the set A, B, C. Note that the brackets differ, in turn, the set A, B is an element of the set A, B, C. It is a set included between the outside brackets. Another example that shows how sets are interpreted includes the following. If B is the set of real numbers that are solutions of the equation x2 equals 9, then the set can be written as B equals x. x2 equals 9, or B is the set of all x such that x2 equals 9. Thus B is 3, minus 3. What is the 15 puzzle? The 15 puzzle was introduced in 1878 by American amateur mathematician Samuel Lloyd, 1841-1911. He called it the Boss Puzzle and later the 15-16 Puzzle. It is one of the most famous puzzles in his book Sam Lloyd's Cyclopedia of 5000 Puzzles. Tricks and Conundrums published in 1914 after his death by his son, Sam Lloyd. This puzzle has 16 squares, 15 of them are numbered from 1 to 15 and placed in a 4x4 configuration. With one position, the 16th, left open. The idea was to reposition the squares from a given arbitrary arrangement by sliding them from place to place until they were in numerical order, 1, 2, 3, and so on. For some initial starting points, the rearrangement was possible, for others, it was not. But Lloyd offered a twist to the puzzle he switched the positions of the squares numbered 14 and 15 and offered $1. 000 to anyone who could solve the puzzle. Working out the puzzle became a craze in America, 
with reports of companies prohibiting employees from playing during office hours it was as popular as playing computer solitaire is today. Even in Europe, the craze grew. Deputies in Germany's Reichstag played the puzzle. And in France it was claimed to be a greater curse than alcohol or tobacco. But Lloyd knew no one could solve the puzzle. Much less remember all the steps taken to try and get to a solution, because there was no solution. How much does air pressure decrease with altitude? It takes mathematics to figure out how much air pressure decreases with altitude. Close to the surface, and due to the pull of gravity. The air pressure exerted by air molecules is greatest, around 1000 millibars at sea level. From there, it declines quickly with altitude to 500 millibars at around 18,000 feet, 5,500 meters. At 40 miles, 64.37 kilometers, it will be 1 slash 10, 000 th of the surface air pressure. This can also be interpreted another way, for altitudes of less than about 3,000 feet, 914.4 meters. The barometric air pressure decreases about 0.01 inches of mercury for each 10 feet, 3 meters. Of altitude, or a decrease of 1 inch of mercury for each 1,000 foot 304.8 meters gain in altitude. If millibars are used, it is 1 millibar for every 26.25 foot, 8 meter, altitude gain. That means if a person takes a ride in an elevator, hits the button for the 50th floor and coincidentally has a barometer in his or her pocket the pressure would fall by approximately 0.5 inch, 1.27 centimeters, during the ascent. This also means that higher altitude cities have major differences in barometric readings. For example, the air pressure in almost mile-high Denver, Colorado, is only 85% that of cities that reside at sea level. What is ecology? Ecology, also known as bionomics, is a branch of biology that deals with the abundance and distribution of organisms in nature, as well as the relations between organisms and their environment. It is an inherently quantitative science, with ecologists using sophisticated mathematics and statistics to describe and predict patterns and processes in nature. Why was mathematics so important to the Greeks? with a numbering system in place and knowledge from the Babylonians. The Greeks became masters of mathematics, with the most progress taking place between the years of 300 BCE and 200 CE. Although the Greek culture had been in existence long before that time, the Greeks changed the nature and approach to math and they considered it one of the if not the most important subjects in science. 
the main reason for their proclivity towards mathematics is easy to understand. The Greeks preferred reasoning over any other activity. Mathematics is based on reasoning. Unlike many scientific endeavors that require experimentation and observation. Where does most of our knowledge of Egyptian mathematics originate? Most of our knowledge of Egyptian mathematics comes from writings on papyrus. A type of writing paper made in ancient Egypt from the pith and long stems of the papyrus plant. Most papyri no longer exist, as the material is fragile and disintegrates over time. But two major papyri associated with Egyptian mathematics have survived. Named after Scottish Egyptologist A. Henry Reend, the Reend papyrus is about 19 feet, 6 meters, long and 1 foot, 1 third meter, wide. It was written around 1650 BCE by Ames, an Egyptian scribe who claimed he was copying a 200-year-old document. Thus the original information is from about 1850 BCE. This papyrus contains 87 mathematical problems, most of these are practical. But some teach manipulation of the number system, though with no application in mind. For example, the first six problems of the Reend papyrus ask the following. Problem 1. How to divide n loaves between 10 men, in which n equals 1, in problem 2, n equals 2. In problem 3, n equals 6, in problem 4, n equals 7, in problem 5, n equals 8, and in problem 6, n equals 9. In addition, 81 out of the 87 problems involve operating with fractions, while other problems involve quantities and even geometry. Reen purchased the papyrus in 1858 in Luxor, it resides in the British Museum in London. Written around the 12th Egyptian dynasty, and named after the Russian city. The mathematical information on the Moscow papyrus is not ascribed to any one Egyptian, as no name is recorded on the document. The papyrus contains 25 problems similar to those in the Reend papyrus. And many that show the Egyptians had a good grasp of geometry, including a formula for a truncated pyramid. It resides in the Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow.